part. The way we do that in LIGO was we glue mirrors, sorry, glue magnets to the back of the mirror and drive these mirrors with an electromagnetic coil. It comes from some amplifier outside the vacuum chamber. So you apply a current through this coil, it creates a magnetic field which pushes and pulls on this magnet and changes the position of the mirror. However, if the mirror is swinging back and forth, then the changing magnetic field due to this magnet in the coil is going to introduce an electromotive force. We call these eddy currents. And this electromotive force will create a current which then passes through this resistor and dissipates energy. And we call this eddy current damping. It's easy to see that the loss due to this mechanism is given by the force constant for this coil. This is just the force on the magnet uh, for a given current through the coil times the pendulum frequency, sorry, times frequency divided by the resistance of the coil and the pendulum frequency squared. It's easy, to, it's fairly easy to derive this. What we have to do to make sure that this thermal noise is not a problem is to, one, make sure that the resistance is as large as is practical for this system. Now, one interesting thing that I want to point out about this form of thermal noise. What is the thermal noise? There's Johnson noise in this resistor, a fluctuating voltage. This fluctuating voltage is going to create fluctuating currents in this coil that push on the magnet. The temperature for the thermal noise that's relevant for this kind of current is not the temperature of the mass. It's the temperature of the resistor. This mass is basically in contact with the thermal reservoir, even though it's not touching it. So this gives you perhaps a clever way to think about reducing thermal noise in systems of these type. You could take this resistor and dump it in liquid nitrogen, reduce its temperature. It's the force laws. The, it's the force on the magnet for a given current in the coil. Clearly, if you have other other things, other metallic substances that are close to the magnet. The motion of this magnet could create an eddy current here, which would also dissipate energy to the ground because there's some resistive path to ground. Is that thinking, is Johnson no AC resistor separate from this? Or is it the same? It's the same. Okay. The frequency dependence of it is different because you're going through this coil and you've got the pendulum frequency to worry about, but it's basically like Johnson noise. You're dissipating you're dissipating uh, current energy in a resistor. Can add Johnson noise to this as well, or is this the only noise from that resistor? This is Johnson noise. This is the only okay. This is Johnson noise. This is how Johnson noise in a resistor would couple to this mirror through this magnet. Right. So we think about it as fluctuation the resistor drive the coil. Yes. But those fluctuations have nothing to do with the temperature of the mass. Similarly, if say a cosmic ray comes zimming through this test mass and puts a charge here, and there's some conductor nearby, it's a metallic substance. This charge is going to create image charges, which will create current distributions on the mass, uh, on, on this conductor. And if this mass moves back and forth, these current distributions have to move. And this can also dissipate energy, and this can also create thermal noise. So, you know, for this and for other reasons, you would want to keep the charge of the test mass low if you could keep conducting surfaces far away. This effect has been measured, the reduction of the increase of the losses of a pendulum due to an electrostatic charge. These three sources of, of uh, damping and thermal noise in the system are all forces that act on the mass as a whole, as a rigid body. It turns out also that all three of these forces are basically these thermal noise sources are un, unimportant for LIGO. The vacuum in the chamber is good enough that gas damping is not a problem. The amplifier has been designed in such a way that the thermal noise from that is not a problem. Hopefully charge will not be a problem. We're not doing very much to measure that right now, but we're all crossing our fingers. I should point out, though, that 
just fixing thermal noise doesn't necessarily solve all your problems. And a lot of these systems will be subject to other noise, non-thermal in nature. I mean, here's a magnet that's attached to the mass. If you have any magnetic fluctuations due to somebody holding a cell phone next to the vacuum chamber, that also could push the mass around. So these are other considerations that, while not thermal noise, definitely relate to the design of systems. Now, dissipation can occur within the test mass itself and lead to fluctuations, not in the, in the position of the mass, because a force within a mass between two of its own parts can't change the center of motion, but they could change the shape of the mass. For example, you could have some sort of thermal noise motion of some of the atoms in the system that create some bulge here on the front. And you could have some other fluctuation, thermal fluctuation, which creates some bulge over here on the back. If your laser beam is reflecting off the mass here, this thermal noise is a big problem. Um, thermal noise here would be less of a problem. So in order to understand the influence of thermal noise within a test mass on the laser beam, we have to think a lot more carefully about the structure of the mass and how the position of the mass is being measured by this laser beam. We have to think very carefully about the resonances of the structure. The mechanical impedance or the mechanical admittance of, of this system, which has a great number of normal modes, is going to be very complicated. There are two approaches that have been used historically, mostly, to estimate the thermal noise of this mass due to its internal modes, the internal thermal noise. It's not practical to take every single atom and ask what its noise motion is and then average over that. There are several moles worth of atoms in the system, and moreover, their motion is not uncorrelated the way it is in an ideal gas. The motion of these atoms with respect to one another is very, very highly correlated. <laughs> However, if you consider the normal modes of this system, these do behave to a fairly good approximation as an ideal gas a non-interacting ideal gas. These normal modes don't see each other. The principle of superposition applies. So what you could do is you could say, well, this mass is made up of an ideal gas of many, many modes. Each of these modes has a dynamical structure that's kind of like a mass on a spring. So we simply just take the thermal noise for all these masses on all these springs and sum them up, and that's the thermal noise. That's what we call the normal modes approach. So what you would do is you would take the thermal noise motion for a mass on a spring, which rather than derive, I'll just give it to you. So you've got some normal mode n, which has a certain frequency. It has a certain effective mass. The effective mass of this mode is not the mass of the mirror itself. The effective mass of this mode is the mass of this mirror itself times some sort of integral which relates how, how the normal mode motion of this specific mode is observed by this laser beam. So for example, a motion which is like this would be very, very well observed by the laser beam, since it has a lot of motion directly where the spot is reflecting off the beam. A mode that, say, might look like this would contribute fairly little. So what you'd have to do is calculate all of these, given a certain laser beam profile, certain laser beam radius, size of the mass, resonance structures. And you can do this. And this was probably best done by uh, Aaron Gillespie and Fred Robb here at Caltech seven or eight years ago. And what they found is that once you got past, say, the first hundred or so modes, you got a series that converged fairly well. But this uh, way of calculating the thermal noise of the system has a fairly serious flaw. 
what if when we installed this mirror we weren't very careful and uh, somebody left a, a wad of gum here? So we have an, uh, a source of loss which is localized uh, to one point on the mass. Or say somebody very, very carefully glued a magnet here and here. I mean, what do those inhomogeneous sources of loss do? What they do is make the thermal noise motion of the normal modes coupled. The normal modes of the system are no longer a, a, a non-interacting ideal gas. They, they're interacting with one another in some way. So this normal mode expansion is not a very good way of dealing with inhomogeneous sources of loss, which we know we have, which we know might be the most important sources of losses in the system. The modern approach is to use the fluctuation dissipation theorem, as has been done to derive this. After all, it's just the fluctuation dissipation theorem applied to every mode independently. But instead say, well, here's a mass. The laser beam is interrogating it here. The laser beam comes, reflects off, it picks up some phase on the round trip. Let us apply not a laser beam, but a force here. And we, we care about the response at a certain frequency. Let it be a sinusoidally varying force, which has a profile identical to the laser beam. And push on this mass and ask, how does the mass dynamically respond to this fluctuating force to its front face? And how much energy is dissipated in the process? This is what we would call the direct application of the fluctuation dissipation theorem, what we sometimes refer to in the business as the Uri Levin approach, because Uri Levin uh, first introduced this idea again here at Caltech about five years ago. He was able to show that for this system, the fluctuation dissipation theorem has a fairly simple basic form Given this fluctuating force F0, all you have to do is figure out how much energy you dissipate in the mass as a result of applying this force and plug it in. Now, calculating this is the trick, because this is basically a fairly complicated exercise in elasticity theory. But it can be done. And what he was able to show, as Gillespie and Rob were able to show for the case of a nice isotropic homogeneous mass, is that this is equal to approximately where this is now the Young's modulus of the material. This is the Poisson's ratio. This is in the case of homogeneous losses. I put this little number here for a good reason. This, this is an approximate form. It's accurate to about a mm, factor of 50% or so. Um, he calculated it for the case of an infinite half mass. So instead of a solid mass like this, which is a complicated system with lots of boundary conditions, he approximated it as an infinite half plane and calculated what the response would be there. He also got little scale factors here and there that enter in at about the 30% level. As it happens, this gives the same answer. These two approaches give the same result. This one turns out to be far more accurate, far more computationally easy, especially when the spot size gets very, very small and the number of modes that could possibly be seen by a small radius spot becomes very, very large. Sigma is Poisson's ratio. Sigma is Poisson's ratio. Philip? Yes? Any yes. If you integrate that over all frequencies, you should get something that's proportional to the force speed. Yes. But if you integrate that formula over the constant uh, loss angle, that formula will diverge to the infinite Yes. I didn't say something when I talked about the frequency dependence of the losses here. 
By the way, to get this formula here, the loss angle that was put in is this, the constant losses, which when you make measurements, as I've done in the laboratory, if you measure the, the uh, losses for a variety of modes in a glass uh, cylinder, you get basically the same loss for every mode, independent of frequency. If, only, if this form is plugged into this equation and integrated down to zero frequency, it diverges. There's an infinite number of energy in this mode. Now, the reason why this is not really a problem is because this is kind of a cheat. The dissipation has to go to zero at zero frequency. Otherwise, you could dissipate energy just by sitting there. Just, just being under a force forever is going to dissipate energy at some rate. It's a mathematical nicety in which, in practice, you never have to worry about because for the, quality, for the losses, the dissipation that we talk about in gravity wave detectors, which is very, very small, you have to integrate down to frequencies where you have to make measurements over more than the lifetime of the universe in order to see any departure from thermodynamics. So really, it's not a practical issue at all. It's certainly the lifetime of the piece of glass. <laughs> Both of these systems suffer from a serious problem. In this system, we've calculated the thermal noise based on a dissipation factor at the frequency at which we're interested in the thermal noise, which is typically, say, 100 hertz. Without saying so, that's what's going in here. This is the frequency. This is the dissipation at a frequency that we care about for gravity waves, which is 100 hertz. But the mirrors that we make these tests on only have resonances in the tens of kilohertz to hundreds of kilohertz range. So when we make measurements of the dissipation, we're making measurements at a frequency which is far away from where we care about thermal noise. So we have to make assumptions that this dissipation that we measure is still the correct dissipation when we, uh, when we extrapolate these results down to lower frequencies. This turns out to be not a very good idea. The structural form of damping, if you make a resonator which doesn't have other sources of loss, and I'll get to one in a moment, the structural damping model for glass or for other materials such as sapphire, which is being considered for the advanced LIGO detector, the structural damping model is quite good. However, there is another form of damping which is present in all materials, which is thermoelasticity. By the way, just at least too much time. I'm going to put the spectrum of the thermal noise for the internal test mass. Against the uh, thermal noise for the for the pendulum just to get a sense of the frequency uh, dependence of the two. This turnover point is typically at some tens of hertz, say 50 hertz, depending on the materials used. If a material has a non-zero thermal expansion coefficient, then when you heat it up, it will either expand or contract. Most things we're used to expand when you heat them. Now, if you look at the thermodynamics of the system that has this property, what this means is if you take this material and expand it, it will cool off. This is the, um, the, the solid equivalent of Joule the Joule-Thomson effect in an ideal gas. When you expand a gas, it can cool off. When you compress a gas, it can heat up. In fact, it's possible to show that when you stretch a material, it has a thermal expansion coefficient, which is not zero. Its temperature will change. And that temperature change is given by this formula. It's given by the Young's modulus times this thermal expansion coefficient squared. This tends to make it a small effect if the thermal expansion coefficient is small. 
times the amount of strain and divided by some materials constants, the material density and the uh, heat capacity per unit volume. That tells you what the temperature change is when you expand or contract something. Delta U is basically a fractional change of length. It's a, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, delta U would be basically equal to delta L over L if this were a rod and you were stretching it. Now, if you have a material and you, say, differentially expand it or differentially stress it, say, for example, I take this table and I push on it here. I'm compressing this part of it here. I'm not compressing this part of it here. What that means is that I'm going to be inducing a temperature change here, but not here. And heat is going to flow down this temperature gradient and dissipate energy. And so there's a dissipation associated with this thermoelastic uh, thermal expansion coefficient. We call this thermoelastic damping. The dissipation is characterized by this dissipation strength. And it has a frequency dependence, which is dependent on the mechanical structure of the system. So for example, if it's a thin rod that you're bending, the time scale is going to be given by the rate of heat flow across this thin rod. And so it would be a very fast process. If it were a very, very heavy, thick rod that you were bending, now the heat has to travel along a much longer distance, and so the time scale of this, this dissipation is going to be much, much slower. But in general, it's going to obey uh, a frequency dependence at something like this. If you take this sort of damping and plug it into an approach like the Levin approach here, what you'll find is that you're going to get uh, a noise due to this dissipation process, which in practice can be larger than this value that we've given here. This has been calculated by uh, Vladimir Burginsky and his co-workers at Moscow State University and confirmed by, uh, by uh, Kip Thorne and, and his graduate student Liu here shortly thereafter. The thermoelastic spectral density of noise looks something like this. Again, the derivation is based on fairly uh, tedious calculations in elasticity. But the result is enough to see the problem we have. This is the spectral density of noise due to thermoelastic damping. If you fuse silica, the thermal expansion coefficient, okay, so this is the thermal expansion coefficient, Poisson's ratio, the density, the heat capacity, sorry, the specific heat, no, the heat capacity. This is the thermal conductivity of the material. It sets part of the time scale of the dissipation. And here's the frequency dependence here plus the dependence on the radius of the laser beam, which is looking at the mass. We see that, for one, the thermal noise for this effect increases far more rapidly as the laser spot size is reduced than the structural damping is. And we see also that it has a different dependence. On the frequency. If you plot the thermal noise density as a function of frequency. For these two effects, what you find is for fused silica, the structural damping has this one over omega to the one half dependence. The thermoelastic damping has a steeper frequency dependence, and it falls generally below the structural damping. 
just for a scale. This is about a thousand hertz. This is about one hertz. And this is 10 to the minus 21 to 10 to the minus 25 meters per root hertz. This is fused silica. For sapphire, which has much lower structural damping, but much higher uh, thermoelastic damping, uh, these two are reversed. So thermoelastic damping is much higher, and the structural damping is lower. Now this is interesting because this thermoelastic damping that you see here is utterly invisible to any measurements that we make on test masses out at the 10 to 100 kilohertz range. We simply don't see it there. All we see is the structural damping, which the structural damping in terms of the dissipation itself, is constant. It's falling off fairly rapidly in the test masses. And additionally, when you're measuring the resonance of a test mass, you're measuring the resonance of some very large mode of it. Say the whole thing is shaking like this. It's a very large system that's shaking, and the thermal gradients are fairly small and distributed. Whereas when we're asking what the thermal noise thermoelastic damping seen by the laser beam is, it's kind of focused around this little spot on the front where the laser beam is reflecting. This example of a noise, noise source, um, which, in, which is invisible to a dissipation measurement, but very, very important to a gravitational wave detector, is something that I want to point out to as a pitfall of the application of the fluctuation dissipation theorem to gravitational wave detectors. You can't measure the dissipation necessarily where you want to in frequency space or in the way that you want to. So just to clarify, the dissipation experiment is where you uh, drive, you set this uh, test mass oscillating. It's oscillating in a normal mode, and the normal mode frequencies are 10 kilohertz or higher. That's right. So that's why it's way out to the right to be measured. That's right. Instead of vibrating, watch the vibrations down out. Yeah. It would be fantastic if we could make a plunger that was the shape of the laser beam, put it on this test mass, oscillate it back and forth, and see how the response of the test mass lagged behind the application of the force. Remember that that lag in the response is what caused the dissipation. So if you can measure that lag, you're basically measuring this angle directly. But this angle takes to the order of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 radians in practice for the materials that we're interested in. That's a very, very hard angle to measure. And when you're taking, say, a plunger and pushing it on something like this, you're undoubtedly going to create new forms of dissipation that you haven't counted on. The way we typically measure cues in a test mass. Is there no hope to do this and instead just measure the heating of the test mass? Well, the rate of heating is very, very, very slow. And again, we could we could put a plunger on the system and press on it, but that's probably going to introduce new sources of fri friction that drown out the effect we want to see. To measure dissipation, I, uh, Kip is right, it's worth pointing out how that's done. The typical way that this is done is to take, say, a test mass and try to find some way of making it freely fro floating in space with no interaction with the outside world possible. Well, that's impossible, so what we do instead is suspend it from a very fine wire as a pendulum. And this wire has been polished with diamond grit and lubricated with pork fat, which seems to be the best thing for this sort of thing, the best low friction material. And we hang it in a vacuum chamber. And then we excite it with some sort of electrostatic drive. We expose it to some electric field gradient. And because it's polarizable, it gets sucked into it. And we find some resonant mode of the system, and we set the electrostatic drive to the frequency of that mode and excite it. And now this normal mode is ringing with high amplitude, and we shine a laser beam on it. Question. Yes. Isn't the pork fat going to... Reduce Q? No, to that water vapor going to the high vacuum detector. Uh... Oh, I'm not pleased at all about using pork fat. <laughs> but yeah, the, it, it's not the best thing in the world. But you ring up this mode, and then you make, say, a Michelson interferometer with this mirror and another mirror, and measure the reflection of the front face of a laser beam coming off. 
and then you just watch the application decay away. And that amplitude of the motion is going to have some form like this. Tau. Where this tau is given by the rate of dissipation. If the dissipation is large, then the time it takes for the energy to be sucked away is very small. And you'll watch this normal mode die away very quickly. If the dissipation is small, this time scale will be very large, and you'll see this thing ring essentially forever. And this is how we measure quality factors. It's the only way that we can make the system as non interacting as possible. Yes? What other forms of internal test mass noise are there that are especially dangerous? Well, Levin's analysis pointed out that if you have some inhomogeneous source of noise on the mirror, it's not so bad if it's far away, like this magnet is, from where the laser is going to be. But it's very bad if it's right where the laser is going to reflect, say like in the mirror coating. Well, it turns out we have a mirror coating and it's a very lossy object. It has its own dissipation. And its thermal noise will contribute disproportionately to the thermal noise of the whole system because it's right there where the laser beam is. This thermal noise has been calculated based on some assumptions about the structure of the coating and how it interacts with the mass, what its mechanical properties are and what its losses are. In truth, we barely know what the mechanical properties of coatings are. And we barely know what the dissipation within a coating is. And this, and this is a very active field of research to measure these quantities because the best indication we have from current measurements is that thermal noise in the mirror coating of the optic is probably the limiting factor in the sensitivity of the experiment. I think people are getting more relaxed because we're getting a better understanding of it, and we know exactly how bad they are. <laughs> and because we know more precisely how bad they are, for example, um, the mirror coatings in LIGO are made from alternate layers of dielectrics with high and low refractive index on the mirror. I've exaggerated the thickness of the coating to show scale. And so you would have, for example, a quarter layer of silicon dioxide, a quarter wavelength of silicon dioxide, and then a quarter layer of tantalum pentoxide, which has a high index of refraction, and then a quarter layer of silicon dioxide again, and the quarter layer of tantalum pentoxide again. And the reflection at all of these interfaces uh, mutually interferes in such a way as to send a very large fraction of the light going back, 99.99, several nines goes back. What we think we've seen now, based on measurements, very painstaking measurements that have been made at MIT and Syracuse and Glasgow and Stanford, is that it seems to be the tantalum pentoxide that is bad. And we're trying to figure out what to do with, about that. I'm arguing that we should get rid of the tantalum pentoxide, but the man who makes these coatings really likes it, and so he wants to try to put it on in some different way. And we'll see how it goes. At least we have some understanding that we kind of know what's good and what's bad, so we can focus on the bad. And this gives us some optimism. So if you didn't change uh, the coding procedures or, uh, or material, uh, just how bad would the coding losses be compared to the general elastic noise layer? Um, I can't give you very specific numbers about that because I haven't seen the latest results applied to a prediction for either LIGO or advanced LIGO. Um, Greg Harry, who's at MIT, who's been central to the analysis of coding loss and to the experimental measurement of, what, of the dissipation in coatings, um, thinks that, for example, in the 40 meter interferometer experiment at Caltech, where there was apparently a test mass-like thermal noise spectrum that didn't quite mount match the dissipation that had been measured for the test mass, that it might just have been the coating that was responsible. Again, the coating loss is something that doesn't show up in a Q measurement. And why that is is easy to see. The coating is 10 centimeters, the mass is say 10 centimeters thick. The coating is less than 10 microns thick. Therefore, its share of the elastic energy is probably going to be something like one part in 1,000 of the whole. 
So any dissipation that's occurring in the coating is going to be very small compared to the amount of elastic energy in the whole test mass. And therefore, if the test mass is ringing, it's not going to dissipate energy very fast with the coating. Most of its energy is elsewhere. I'd like to close with a discussion of suspension thermal noise, um, because that's something that I spend most of my time working on. And I find this to be a very rich subject and a very interesting one, so I'm going to take some time now to shill for a talk that I'll be giving on this uh, Friday at 4 o'clock in the Arms Building. It's posted around Bridge, so if you'd like to see it, I can present some data from experiments I did last year. No. Is it a Jaguar talk? It's a LIGO talk. It's either the Jaguar or it's LIGO. It's the same time as the Jaguar. It's the same time. Is, is it the same talk? Yeah. There's only one, there's only one talk. There's one talk next week. I think you are at the Jaguar talk. It's this Friday. Or is it this Friday? It's this Friday. Okay, this Friday. This Friday at 4. In the arms lecture hall. Let's see. Which shall I... Now, as I pointed out, the mirror in LIGO is suspended from a thin wire. And that seems like kind of a strange thing to do, but I'm sure it's been described to you in an earlier talk. But the reason you do this is because you want to isolate this mirror from any seismic or acoustical excitation that is coming from the outside world. And above the resonant frequency of a pendulum, it isolates suspension point motion very effectively. However, this wire in LIGO, it's a loop of wire that comes around the system and comes back up, um, itself is made out of stuff which has its own dissipation. And so this wire, in response to this dissipation, is going to have some fluctuating motion, some thermal noise. And this fluctuating motion is going to pull the mirror back and forth. This thermal noise is going to be probably the limiting noise source in the detector in the low frequency range, say from about, oh, 20, 30 to maybe 100 hertz. Now for LIGO, these wires are made out of steel. Uh, for advanced LIGO, these wires are going to be made out of few silica because the dissipation in few silica is two orders of magnitude or more lower than the dissipation in steel wire. Now the sources of dissipation in a, a, few, in, in a suspension wire are pretty much the same as the sources of dissipation that you would see in a test mass. It's going to have some sort of structural damping, just some loss that's not dependent on frequency for some reason. It's going to have some sort of surface loss, rather like the coating loss, because the surface of, a, of an object tends to be a little bit messier it has scratches and nicks and dirt on it. And these will lead to increased dissipation. So you'll find that for a wire where the surface to volume ratio is quite large, that the dissipation in the surface is more important. Uh, you'll find thermoelastic damping uh, in a, a wire, just as you'll find thermoelastic damping in the test mass. Although in this case, the thermoelastic damping is very easy to analyze. In fact, it's precisely given by this formula. with a slightly different form than was given before. Well, I'm nearly out of time, so let me just uh, close up what I'm talking about with the source of damping in the wire, and I guess I'll stop for now. Here, the thermoelastic damping in a fiber is very much like the thermoelastic damping in a test mass. Here, because the fiber is a very simple geometry to model, it's just a bent rod under tension, um, it's very easy to know what the time scale of the dissipation is. It has nothing to do with the size of a laser beam. It's just given by 
the thickness of the wire uh, divided by the thermal, di the thermal diffusivity of the material times some cofactor of order 0.1 or so, which has to do with the geometry of the wire. Is it circular? Is it a ribbon? It goes as the thermal expansion coefficient as before, but it turns out that if the Young's modulus of the, of the wire or the fused silica fiber uh, is a function of temperature, uh, this will also create temperature changes in the material when it's stretched if it's under a strain already. This is the static strain of the wire, which will tend to increase the damping of the material. It turns out that for uh, steel wires, this is not such a big deal. The structural form of the damping is the most important thing. LIGO 1 is not going to have thermoelastic damping. For the fused silica wires of advanced LIGO, it turns out this nonlinear thermoelastic damping is probably the most important noise source in the detector. Fortunately, it has this nice characteristic that this minus sign here allows you to cancel out this thermoelastic damping if the temperature dependence of the Young's modulus, the thermal expansion coefficient, and the strain uh, satisfy a fairly simple relationship. It turns out that for if, if you can set the static strain of this fiber to, this, to that value, then this damping goes away and the thermal noise of the suspension gets better. That's in fact where we're designing advanced LIGO to operate. I think that's pretty much all I have time for. I do apologize. I had more.